topic that I, I, I love, uh, memory hierarchy and caching. I don't directly work on caching, but a lot of my research work is on memory hierarchy design, uh, how to make sure your data access is really fast. But before we go in there, before we go in there, uh, a quick announcement, again, I guess re-announcement. Uh, tomorrow, there's a makeup class, one to three o'clock. Uh, I would modify the meeting link today so you can use the same link. I'm going to change the date so that it actually appears tomorrow. And then I'm going to change it back so that you can join on Thursday as well. All right. Basically, I'm going to fiddle, fiddle around with the link. And if I fail, if I fail, I'll send you an announcement saying, hey, I failed to modify the link. Here's a new link for tomorrow uh, makeup class. But it should work. I think I should be able to reschedule the meeting link with the same, basically, uh, the same uh, link that you've been using. All right. So that's the first announcement. The second announcement, midterm is graded. You guys are doing really, really well. Uh, we just, now is the, the grade is out. But there's a few more things that might change your score. We are basically drawing, doing a pairwise comparison between your submitted codes and your friends to make sure there's no plagiarism. Um, I'm gonna weed out the extreme cases and I might need to check with you on what's going on. All right. Uh, so again, cat, well, no, no, okay, well, no, see that. Um, and I think that's all my announcement today. So let's go through some recap of what we cover on last Thursday related to memory hierarchy and the memory in general, right? So if you want to go buy your own memory, one thing you can do, right? You can go to advice.co.th, uh, JIB, or you go to the physical store, Power Mall and uh, Banana IT and many, many other stores, right, that sell memory. What you want in them is you want your memory to be fast, right, and big. You want the memory to have, like, terabytes of data. Who wouldn't want that, right? You never run out of memory. How many people open up Chrome tabs to the point that your computer hangs or getting really slow? Anyone? Rest your hand if that happened. I'm sure it happened to everyone, including myself, right? And then what would be your first response to that? Oh, happened with Air 4 with Googling too much. Grab a hammer. Okay. Um, as long as you don't bash your computer to, well, as long as you don't do the same thing as what you've been doing for A2 and A4, Three and I guess a four, you you you'll be okay. Like your computer would be okay to some extent, right? Uh, you also want to to be cheap, right? You want it to be cheap, zero cost. So you want the memory to be big, right? That you you can keep opening up Chrome tabs, and they can use five gigabytes of memory and making sure my cat doesn't doesn't destroy my printer, and also um. And also, get it for free. Get it for free, right? That would be ideal. You also want a lot of bandwidth, right? This will be re working really well for a GPU, for example, which demands a lot of bandwidth, right? But the thing is, these things conflict with each other. So how does the computer architect solve this problem? Actually, this is like a computer architecture problem. We have things that we know cost certain amount of money, right? And we know what are the demand coming from the user. As a good, hopefully good architect, right? I would be able to build something out of it that meets your demand without breaking your bank, right? without breaking your bank and hopefully maybe exceed the demand or lower the cost even further, right? Uh, so what are the tools that we have? To look at the tools, we need to first look at the current memory technology. I have so many cats in this room right now. Um, the first thing is called SRAM. These are really, really, really fast, but it costs quite a bit. It costs six transistors. You also have DRAM, 
a lot cheaper. It's only one transistor and one capacitor. The capacitor store a few electrons that reads one or zero, right? And what would you really need for the memory technology? You need to be able to trap the value, right? The trapping, the value in the cell. So these are something that that um, computer engineer should know. But if you ask a computer engineer in Thailand, it's like I have no idea. Um, you need to be able to trap the value in the cell, and you need to be able to read and write the value to and from these cell. You need to be able to trap them and read and write into them, right? Also, you might be having some question of what about other technology? There's also other technology. Ha anyone heard about solid state technology? SSD, right? There's also emerging technology that not is not SSD, but the way the material works and the way you read the data has some similar properties such as non-volatility, you write something in there, it stays there forever, right? But it's fast. It's fast, almost as fast as DRAM. So these are some new technology that people are currently actually looking into and see if we can use it to replace DRAM. Uh, it's already quite, right now, like a few startup companies that might look, be looking into this direction um there's also a product that you can buy uh that that would have memory with these properties that you can try right but for for the purpose of this class just be aware that they exist not just sram and dram there's also many other technology for the memory but the dominant one is sram and dram so what is the trade-off? As I said, SRAM is really fast, but smaller, right? The cell is big. So the size of how many bytes you can store, is going to be smaller, but it's going to be really fast. So if you have like less than one kilobytes of SRAM, these can take less than one nanosecond to read or write to it. Uh, if, it's look, if you're looking at like kilobytes to megabytes of data, it's still a few nanoseconds, but it's a lot faster than DRAM, for example. So gigabytes of DRAM, DDR3 and DDR4, I need to double check the timing for DDR5. I don't have the number on top of my head, but if you look at DDR3 and DDR4, you're looking at something around like 10 nanosecond to 15 nanosecond or more, depending on how you read these memory, right? So the conclusion is this, memory is slow. Why? So what is the typical clock cycle, clock speed that you can get from a CPU these days? Can someone draw me one number, clock speed that you can buy from a market for, a, for your CPU? Any any ballpark number? How about a 3.3 gigahertz? All right, yeah, thanks Google. I have something really close by as well. 3.3 gigahertz. So in one nanosecond, how many cycle I can proceed? In one nanosecond, can someone do that math for me? I know it's afternoon, so that's why I asked you to do math. It's the perfect thing to do in the afternoon, right after you've been eating, and also <laughs> perfect time. Nap time, math. So, how many cycle is one nanosecond? What is ten over three point three? What is ten over three point three? Right. It's about three cycles. So it means that in one nanosecond, I can do, for example, three ads. In one nanosecond, I can do three ads with a really basic CPU, right? 
how many data access to DRAM I can do in one nanosecond if I say DRAM is this slow. So in one nanosecond, how many access to DRAM can I do? Actually, it's not a trick question. In one nanoseconds, how many access to DRAM can I do? Zero, right? I still haven't even finished my first access. So the conclusion is memory is slow. Even with the new technology, it's going to be slower than your CPU. Why? It's just that it's easier to make CPU clock go faster than memory going faster. Uh, so what can you do? So as a programmer, what can you do? How many people are taking fun, fun par this semester? How many people are taking fun par? So I was chatting with John Kana, so I know this topic would get brought up today. Uh, yeah, you learn cool trick with caches. You know about cache friendliness, right? So what can you do from the pro programmer point of view? To, to avoid going to the memory. Just do a cool trick with caches. In fact, a lot of what Ajahn Kanat is expert on is using cool trick with caches so that, yes, you're always going to the cache, right? Because if you look at this, let's just go back one slide, right? If you just stay in the cache, you stay in SRAM, Look at this number alone, it's as if you can make your program 10x faster, right? And as Charles suggests, this can go 127x faster. It's actually really cool, right? To see that as a programmer, if I know that cache exists, if I know that cache exists and I know how it works, I can make my program going 100 times faster. Is that a good number? Is that a good number? That is pretty awesome, right? You just rewrite the program, the exact same program, but now your program gets a lot faster. It gets a lot faster, right? The, the, some of the key tricks is how can you hide the fact that your memory is really slow? There's so many things you can do actually. Um, but again, if you look at the data size that you're dealing with right now, a lot of the application would use the data that are way bigger than the cache. So optimization is getting harder and harder as well, right? It's just more challenging, but as a programmer, you should, you should enjoy these challenges because you should keep tackling them and make things even faster, right? But let's speed up the memory access and learn how caching works. You now you already saw some magic trick, right? Uh, with caches in FunPar. For those of you who haven't taken FunPar, there are things you can do as a programmer in Rust or C or C++ to make your program actually going really fast. But before we begin, let's look into how do we build your computer so that we have a cache so let's be greedy we want both fast and large memory we want memory to be really fast and also really big so the idea is now we're gonna have multiple level of memory observation is my dram is slow but sram is fast so why don't i just use the sram as the intermediate steps before going to dram this is actually called the memory hierarchy. You can have a really fast SRAM as a level one cache that store only just a few pieces of data before you have to go to the level two cache and then the level three cache. Then you go to DRAM if you need to go beyond that, right? Certain data center, certain high performance computing server can go to L4 can also go to embedded DRAM. You have now DRAM on, on the motherboard, right? That are faster than your um, 
the, the DRAM that you plug in to your motherboard. And this is what the hierarchy would look like. So let's say you have three core CPU. The fact that I draw three cores, just basically I only have enough room to draw three boxes. Um, if it's normal computer, you can have four core, six core, and eight cores these days, right? They would first check if the data is in the L1 cache or not. If it's not there, then you go and check the share L2 cache, for example, and then the main memory. This is one of the kind of like a default uh, architecture that you can buy and see on your CPU, right? What about L3? Just have no room to draw here. If that's L3, it's just basically the layer in between. So L3 will be here. Again, sorry, I have no room to draw. I just, if I, I try to draw L3 and it looks really ugly, uh, I can use a smaller font size. Uh, I guess that works for online classes, but when we use this on a projector, it is, it's not really big enough. So yeah. Yeah, so L3 would fit between the L2 and the main memory. So now let's look at caching, right? But before we go there, I, I want to have a high level overview, right? How many people here are coffee drinker? How many people here enjoy drinking coffee? Are you too occasionally, right? So if you love coffee, uh, one thing that you might become is you buy your own. How many people buy your own coffee beans and uh, grinder and have the machine at home? Okay, for those of you who like coffee, it's getting there. Oh, Nespresso machine works too. Those are awesome. Um, so let's say in my case, I have my own coffee beans, right? And let's say you need to, 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 to get coffee beans. Think of the register as your cabinet, like your kitchen cabinet that have some random items that you, you need right now, right? But it, it can run out, right? So if it doesn't have coffee beans, what do you do? What would be the quickest place that you can try to find coffee beans? Go to a store nearby. So I guess I can go to nearby 7-Eleven or Family Mart, right? And hopefully they have something in stock. Uh, more than I did not, right? So if I don't have that, if I cannot find it in a nearby 7-Eleven that I can walk and get there within probably less than five or 10 minutes, right? Uh, think of this as a cash. Think of 7-Eleven as the cash or the family mart or the store nearby as the cash. And coffee beans as your data, as your data that you want to access. So let's say I have to access a data in my array right that's your coffee beans it's not in the register so you need to go to the nearby store if it's not there where can i check next i can go to a nearby uh, shopping mall right to to get the coffee bean and hopefully more than have you go to shopping mall are you gonna be able to find coffee bean high chance right but you how much more time do you have to spend if you want to go to a shopping mall? Unless the mall is bad, yes. Um, also, the sort of really, really high chance that you can come back with a coffee bean, but you have to spend a lot more time, right? You might be spending in total one hour. You have to start a car, drive there, search the mall, and then find the beans that you want before you come back, right? Uh, what else? If you cannot find your data at the memory, this is basically, for example, when Chrome use all your memory, right? Some of your data can get kicked out of the memory and that will be stored on your disk. This is kind of like going to a coffee farm in Thailand to buy a coffee bean. It's going to be really slow, right? 
And then if you look at network drive, it's kind of like fly to a farm in Brazil to get your coffee beans, right? In terms of how much slower. Um, this feels so extreme, but going to the memory is in so DRAM, right? Cache is kind of like one, two, three nanosecond, right? This is kind of like 10 to uh, 100 nanosecond. This thing, you're looking at like microsecond or millisecond, depending on like hundreds of microsecond or millisecond. How much bigger is 100 nanosecond over 1 millisecond? And we don't look at online shopping. <laughs> it, it breaks this analogy. 10,000 times, right? So if you go to a coffee farm in Thailand, probably a lot longer than going to a mall, right? But is this definitely millisecond? Why? When you play a, a, an online game, what's the ping? Nine thousand. Well, that that's extreme. But you're looking at like. 10 of millisecond, right? That that can take a while as well, right? So so you this look extreme. This look extreme. That's a really good comment because in the computer, it's also this extreme. When your data is not on your memory, things get extreme. That's why you think your computer hangs when you use too much memory. It's actually not hanging. It's trying to run the same program. It's just that every single data access is much longer. All right. Now do you see a clearer picture? Um, yeah, maybe it's not hanging. It's just actually spending time getting to the data. Right. And and the reason why I use this extreme example is because in fact, if you look at the time scale where your CPU operate in nanosecond. But your disk operate in microsecond or millisecond, now things get really extreme, right? So hopefully you now get the picture of you want your program to be cache friendly because those are fast, right? Those are really fast. So how do we use the cache? So now the next question I want to ask everyone to think, right? To think is, well, how can I use the cache? The thing is, Yes, yes, great comment. So the comments on the chat is preferably we want our data to be read and write in the register or the cache. Yes, always. If you want to speed things up, make sure they are in the cache. And there are many, many, many papers and techniques and a lot of things that researchers and scientists have been uh, coming up with and they are all cool, right, on how do we manage the data in the cache and how to manage the program such that your program stays in the cache. So you think that, how do I use the cache? So can you directly control, can you directly control what go into the cache? The thing is, what is the ISA? Anyone remember ISA? What is the ISA? What is the ISA? Is how you is 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 the interface like it's not a manager. It's more like a command that you can tell the computer to do. These are the things that programmer can send the command to. Do this, do that. If it's not in the ISA specification, you can't do it as a programmer. The thing is, the thing is. The ISA doesn't allow you to manually control the cache. Cache in your CPU is hardware managed. In your modern computer, cache is managed in hardware, except for some few exceptions, like a GPU, for example. GPU has this thing called scratch pad, which is a software managed cache. And you, you have to write a pro, if you have to write a program, 
that tell exactly what goes into the cache, your program would be really complicated. So it's a good thing in general to make this hardware managed because how many people got sick of malloc? How many people, how many people here got sick of malloc? Yeah, I see a lot of hands, right? So in ma malloc is just managing the memory. Right? It's only one element of managing the memory. What if I tell you this? You have to manage the cache too. You have to tell, oh, this data go into the cache. This data, this data doesn't go into the cache. And before you terminate the program, don't forget to kick those data out of the cache. Ah, great question, great question. This is a question that say, what would happen if our program try to use the cache? So we will learn on Thursday, what are the policy to tell what data goes into the cache and what data would get kicked out of the cache. It's not data races in the sense that by definition, data races um, is when you have two parallel program that want to access the data. And the way you get to modify the data can make your program becoming buggy because both threat. I don't want to say too much here because it's going to confuse the heck out of you. But data rest is basically when you try to modify some shared data and the result of the modification is not the intention of your program. For example, for example, you can think of, let's say you have a bank account, right? And you want to withdraw 100 baht from it. But let's say you have a clone that your clone also try to withdraw 100 baht. So the actual thing that should happen is you should have negative 200 baht deducted from your account, right? But with data rest, if you go and try to modify the account at the same time, at the exact same time, one thing that can happen is you ended up with just deducting 100 baht instead of 200 baht. So that's data rest, right? So it's a different problem. When you try to modify the program and use the cache at the same time, basically we call this interference. One program can kick the other program's data out of the cache. So if my data is not in the cache anymore, what would happen to my program? We, okay, so there are two things I'm going to ask. First, is there any correctness problem? Will there be any correctness problem? Assuming that the, the hardware managed the cache correctly, will there? So I, I think that we have to kind of talk about how we manage the cache as well. Right, but there's no correctness pro problem by design. There's no correctness problem. It's just your program would get slower. That's actually one of the reasons, for example, if you run two programs together, right? Anyone try to open up two programs and then you realize that they're getting slower. Like you op like when you have yeah, so you 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 open up two programs, right? It's gonna feel slower than having only one program on your computer and use it, right? That can be one of the reasons behind that because of the interference in the cache. Both program needs the data. They try to use the cache. They keep each other data out. We will talk about this problem actually on Thursday, and it's. I'm glad that you bring it up because on the Thursday lecture, I'm not talking about multiple programs. So I'm going to, I'm going to discuss about that on Thursday as well. Um, uh, it's really good to know, and it would explain some of the slowdown that you see when you use a computer. But before we go there, before we go there, let's go with the basic terminology. All right. You remember the move instruction that we have, right? Sometimes we call this a store or load instruction. Right, basically it's either you store something to the memory or you load some data from the memory, right? What's the size of the load and store that you've seen so far? What's the size? How big is that? It can be one byte, 
two bytes in one word or four bytes, depending on the instruction, right? But this is going to be roughly one word or like one, two, four, and eight bytes, right? Cache also operates in its own unit. It has its own unit of data. We call this a cache block. What does the word block mean? What does the word block mean? So the word block literally means just a, a chunk of thing, right? It's a chunk of thing, and that's actually a, like a great word for it. Sometimes we call a cache block a cache line. So same thing. Cache line, cache use confuses me when I was undergrad. I was like, what the heck? Like, I see cache line here, I see cache block over there. Yeah, same thing. Um each cache block is mapped to some location of the cache. It's mapped to some location of the cache. And then access is to a certain part of the cache block. So so we'll go through an example. All right, we'll go through an example. These are some terminology. That's this thing called cache block that has certain size. And the block would be somewhere in your cache. When you load or store, when you look up your data, the cache hit means that I found my data in the cache. Cache miss means that I cannot find the data in the cache. It's not there. That's it. So that's cache block, cache hit, and cache miss. All right, three words. Why doesn't why doesn't it use byte? Uh, great question. We will talk about this when we talk about uh, locality in, in a bit. In a bit, I'll I'll I'll, I'll tell you in a bit. Right, but it's designed so that your program get even faster. It's designed so that it's first easier to manage, second, get a lot faster. So what information do you need? What information do you need to manage the cache? So I, I guess I'll go with the first easiest thing. You need the data. <laughs> you need to put the data in the cache, all right? But to be able to search, where, whether that's your data or not, right? What else do you need? The word lookup is searching the data. What else do you need? Some form of an address, right? If you use an address to check the content of your cache, you are expected that you, you get either a cache hit or a cache miss, all right? But can we do better? Do you need to store the full? How big is your address? How big is an address? Depends on the machine. So let's say a 64 bit machine. Eight bytes, right? So if you store the entire address, you need eight bytes per word. Right, and your data is how big? Well, in the biggest size, it's basically eight bytes of low one word, right? Uh, this is too big. This is too big because you, you you spend eight bytes to store the data and you also have to spend another eight bytes to store the address. Too big, can we do better? Can we do better? The thing is, if you look at what's inside the cache, there's an area that store almost like an address. We call this a tag. What does the word tag mean? What do we use the tag for in real life? What is tag? What's name tag for? Yeah, it's basically to identify, right? It, it is to identify items on what are they? What, what is that thing, right? So you use these parts of the cache to store the tag. The tag is associated with the data. The data is actually the data you want to read or write, right? 
And when you want to search, when you want to search for your data, parts of the address, not all, only parts of the address is used as a tag. Parts is used as a tag. The other part is used as an index. It's used as an index. So before we go into that, before we go into that, I'm going to show some ex uh, some example, some example. Right. Here is the cache organization, right? So the cache contains multiple cache blocks. As I said, there's a unit of cache block and there's a size of the cache. And the size of your cache is going to be bigger than the cache blocks, which means that you can contain multiple cache blocks in your cache, right? Each block belongs to a set. What does the word set do in mathematics? What is a set? It's a collection of things, right? So a cache block belong to one set, one set. Right, and if it's duplicate block, block it's gonna still basically one item in that set. Each memory address, each address you try to access, will be mapped to a certain cache set. So let's look at these three bullet points alone and draw some picture. All right, so here's a picture I want to draw. The overall thing here is my cache, right? this whole big box is my cache as you can see here how many blocks does my cache contain how many blocks 16 right i have 16 blocks and how many sets are here eight as i said parts of the address will be used as an index parts will be used as the task so this is your address the index will tell you the set number. For example, if your index is five, is your in, if your index here is the number five, you go to set number five. If the index is three, you go to set number three. Then once you're in set number three to search whether that's your data or not, you use the tag. We will we'll go through that example in a bit, but let's go with the organization example. So let's say I have the cache of uh, 512 bytes and the cache block size is 32 bytes. And then, uh, each set have four blocks. How many cache set do you have? How do I do this math? It does look almost like a hash map to you and it, yes. These things looks almost like a hash map. The hash function goes for basically what is the index bits. That's the hash function. The tag will be used to then compare the item in your hash map. So if you take a class that cover hash map before, this is almost like that. It's kind of like a hash table. Four. So let's do the map, right? So you have five to four bytes each. Each block is 32 bytes. So if you divide this by 32, which will result in what? That's 2 to the 9, 2 to the 5, 2 to the 4. I think it's 16, right? There will be 16 blocks in total. Each set has four blocks. Each set has four blocks. So I have four sets in total. Because if you draw, if you think about this, table here, right? You have 16, 16 boxes, 16 cache blocks, right? And each, each 
row has four boxes. So in total, you're going to have how many? Uh, each, each set has four boxes. So you're going to have four sets in total. All right. So that's the organization. But now let's look at, I have an address. How do I find my data? It's called cache lookup. I have an address. How do I store my data? All right. So let's take a five minutes break. We'll be back at three or six and we'll cover it. Actually, let you mind if I do uh, go make some coffee. Let's just let, let's come back at three or eight. Resume. Three or eight PM. I'm going to quickly make coffee and I will come back and look at how do I look up my data? How do I find my data in the cache? All right. Definitely not going to coffee farm. I fetch everything into my register. It's in my uh, cabinet. I have so much coffee beans right now. All right, so let's take a quick break. Uh, I'm going to pause. But they're fun. Like cats. Anyway, so now let's talk about they haven't already. I don't think they have yet. That that dog that dog person. So it means that they still have more job for the cat to do to convince them to be a cat person. Um, I'm joking. Uh, they're both lovely. It's just cat is a lot easier to maintain. I I, I just don't have the energy to like walk the dog and do that every day. Anyway, so. When you look at the data in DRAM, right? How big is your memory for your computer? You're looking at 16 gigabytes, right? 32 gigabytes, maybe, if you're rich. Uh, you look at server or data center that can go to like 500 gigabytes or even like 768 gigabytes, right? Uh, so the data in DRAM is going to be a lot bigger than what is in your cache. This means that not every single piece of your data in DRAM are in the cache. So the process of searching is called cache lookup. Basically, see if my data is in the cache or not. This process involves first, how do I search for the cache? What is what's the first thing? What the first thing do I need to be able to search for my data? I need my address, right? I need my address. So my address, as I said, here's your address, will be divided into the tab, the index, and then the last part here, I'll call it byte in block. The byte in block is basically used to tell which byte are you trying to access in, inside a cache block, right? Then the index bit will give you the set. The tag will give you the identity of the cache block. So the index index bit tells the potential location of the search data. The tag bits tell whether the data the data actually belong to the address you're searching or not, right? So, how many people have been to a movie theater? I'm sure everyone been to a movie theater, right? At some point in your life, not not during COVID pandemic, but before that. Oh, I think even now, right? Can I assume that everyone's been to a movie theater? How do you search for your seat? Because when you walk in, the theater is going to be not well lit, right? It's going to be dark. You find the row and then the seat number, right? Look at the ticket. Think of the ticket as your address. Think of the ticket as your address. The f <laughs> you can. <laughs> All right. <laughs> be an ass and sit at the base seat. I can actually, I, I can use this analogy here. I cannot do it in the US. Let me tell you a story. So if you go to a movie theater in the United States, you don't have row and a seat number, actually. 
you just go there and pick your own seat so you can be an ass and sit at the best seat actually in the state um not here over here in thailand you have the row number and then you have the seat numbers right so which one are you going to pick first? Are you going to go with the row number first? Or are you going to go with the correct seat number and find the row? You go row first, right? Because you can walk through each row before you walk into the row and find your seat, right? So you can look at the row number as the set ID. The row number is your index bit. Right, so if you look at the uh, like cinema, in this case, the index bits is your row number. Then your tag will be in uh, the seed number, and that's it. Think of this analogy, and that's all. Index bit tell you the row number. This is the set. Row number would tell you the set. The tag bits would tell you the uh, the the cash block that will have your data. All right. Any questions so far? Any questions so far? It's actually as simple as that. Index will tell you the number for the cash set direct translation so if the index bit so let's say your index bit is 101 what's the set you're going any guess if the index ah great question great question i'll come back to that but let's say index bit is 101 your set id you go to set five if the index bit is 111 then you go to set number seven it's really simple why simple? I mean, why do we have to make it complicated when you design a hardware? So this is one thing that we as a hardware architect have to make trade off all the time. The simpler your logic, the cheaper your design is going to get. So this simple thing, if it works, keep it that way. It's simple to design. It works. That's good. All right. There's a question on the chat that says, physically, how is cache different from the memory? So cache is faster. Cache use a different material, so that's why it's faster, but it costs a lot more. So you don't, you're not gonna have like multiple megabytes of cache. You will have like maybe two megabytes of the cache or four megabytes of the cache or maybe 16 megabytes of the cache. So it's gonna be a lot smaller than the main memory, but because they are fast, you would like to be able to put your data in the cache. All right. Is it more clear now? And the way you search for your data, for the cache, you use index and the tag bits. For the memory, you just go flat out, use the address. So the different material, the different way you go and access the data, memory is byte addressable. So that's go back to the earlier question is said, why don't you just have a, a one byte cache block right so if you use one byte cache block in that case the the combination of the tag and the index bit will cover the entire address the overhead to maintain that is too high but in the memory is okay because everything is slow in that world anyway right so you can search each byte and use the address to search so that's another difference. Uh, the cost, the cost, like how much dollars, like how much, how many baht do you have to pay for the same capacity, right? Is also different. The, the memory is a lot cheaper. Why can't the memory use the tag? The reason behind that is that they use something similar to the, the index and the tag bit, so it's different. Um, Maybe I should talk about this tomorrow. Would would it be okay if I talk about the DRAM, how DRAM works tomorrow? It's not going to the exam. I'm gonna record the session and hopefully by the end you all see and know how DRAM works in a better detail. 
but I'm gonna have to talk about it anyway in the PCSA class, right? So I'm not sure if we should talk about it now or wait until the 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 next uh, class to talk about it. But one of the reasons is memory is byte addressable. And there are certain things that we use as something like an index. And because you don't have to check whether your data is there or not, there's a, a different mechanism to tell whether your data is in the memory or in the disk. So, ah, uh, yeah, sure, we can do that. So we've covered everything we need to cover. I can talk briefly about that uh, on how does the index thing for, for uh, memory actually work. But the thing is, because you guarantee that your data is going to be in the memory, so you don't need a tag. You just need an address to tell where is your data. All right, is it more clear? So it's kind of like everything becomes an index <laughs> because you need to tell where that thing is. All right, so how do we get the index bits, right? So each address would point because when you have an, a memory address, right, these point to each byte, these point to each byte, and a cache block is a bunch of data, right? In your CPU, in your CPU, this is 64 bytes for the CPU, all right? Certain GPU can have 32 bytes cache block. It's like, it's the hardware design. It's like one of the defined elements in hardware. What does this mean? It basically means that for your address, right, for your address, the last, the last lock and bit will be used to tell what byte inside the block you're trying to access. So the and least significant bits are going to be reserved for each byte in the cache line or cache block, right? This allow you to access the correct the correct byte inside the cache block. So let's say n is log two, log two of the number of unique addressable location in the cache block. For example, if your cache block is 64 byte, in this case, n is log two of 64. What's log two of 64? Six, all right six bits. This would be called the byte in block bit. The next set of bits are for the index. How do we help? How many index bits do we need? That's the log two of number of cache sets. So let's say I have 16 sets. Let's say I have 16 sets. How many bits do I need to tell? between number zero to number 15. How many bits do I need for that? It's log two. Let's say you have 16 sets, right? Example. Uh, uh, that's gonna be log two of 16, which is four. So you use four, the next four bits. The rest are the tag bits. So in this example, right? So in this example, this is your address. I said we need six bits for the byte in block. Then you need four bits for your index. The rest are the tag bits. And that's all. That's all you need to know about how to get the index bits, how to get the tag bits. Yes. Sure. This is actually one of the most important slides for this section of the class. So let's say you have a 64 byte cache block, right? And you, when you have an address, you need to be able to access each individual byte in there, which means that the last lock end of the cache block size, lock end of a cache block size would be used to tell Am I going to byte one in the cache block or byte seven or byte 14 or byte 34 or byte 67 or 57, right? Now, is, it, is that part clear? The lowest bit you, it will be used to tell what byte am I trying to access inside the cache block. All right, so now we have 
whatever number left, right? The next thing I need to tell, you imagine you go to a movie theater. The next thing you need to be able to tell is the row, the index, the set ID, right? The set ID, what set am I going to? What row am I going to for my seats? That's the index bits. So let's say I have 16 sets in total. It means that I need lot two of 16 bits to tell what row or what sets am I going to, what row in a the theater or what sets in the cache that I'm going to, right? Is that part clear? Basically the next four bits. This part is the byte in block. This part is the index. The rest, that's it. The rest of the bits are the tag bits, and that's all. That's all I want you to get out of basically this lecture. Now, with this concept, with this concept, the number of blocks, the number of blocks that can go into a set means that the cache can have different names. All right, these are the last few things I want to talk about before we call today and like that's it for the today lecture. The first thing is something called direct map cache. All right, this is a new terminology, but this is simple. Direct map cache means one cache block per set. All right, clear. That's it. It's a cache that has one cache block per set. That's all clear, clear, yes, no. That's what direct map cache is. So to dive a little bit deeper on the definition, basically, if I have a cache block, my cache block will go into that one single set. And to search, right, the index bits become the set ID. And if you look at the tag, if the tag match, this is basically similar to normal like cache lookup. If the tag match, cache hit, otherwise cache miss, right? This is like when you have a movie theater where each row, each row have only one seat. Each row have only one seat. If you hit, if you have a cache hit, you return the data. If not, you go to the next level of the cache, right? So my quick question is this. Can I write a program that I never hit in the cache if I have a direct map cache? Is it possible? So let me first ask this question. Is it possible that I write a program that would never have a cache hit if I have the direct map cache? Even though I have data reuse. So even though my program only do this, this is my program. Read from address A, then you do read from address B. So your access is just, I go to address A, address B, address A, address B, address A, and then address B, and then delete. This is my program. I just loop forever. A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B, and A is one address, B is another address. Can I get 0% hit rate with this simple program? How many people think it's impossible? Because I use A, I use B. So the first time I might not have the data in the cache, but afterward, both A and B will be in my cache, right? So how many people think it's impossible to get 0% hit rate? So it's not faulty too, but let's say, let's say A has a tag of seven, index nine, B has the tag three, index 
nine. What would happen? <coughs> what would happen in that case? Will I ever get a cash hit actually? What happened when I first go search for A, A get put in the cache, right? In the cache right now, I have tag seven at set nine. What set does B go to? Set nine, right? But tag for B is three. Is that a cache hit or a cache miss? Right now in the cache, that's tag seven sitting in there, but my access is for tag number three. Is that a cache hit or a cache miss? It's a miss. What would happen in that case, B kicks A out. B kicks, so we will go, we get to that in a bit. Uh, B kicks A out and replace a inside the cache. So now B is in the cache. The next access is to A, but B is in the cache. So A comes in, but okay, cache missed again. I kick B out, A comes in. The next access is to B. So they alternate going into the cache and we never get a cache hit, right? So that's a great question on the chat. How is it possible that there should be one cache block per set? Well, these are hardware configuration. I can build a cache with these particular configuration too. The benefit of this, the benefit of this type of cache is they're fast and they're simple to design. Actually, this is a, 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 one of the really simple cache to design. You don't need to compare things. Uh, like you don't have to compare a lot of things. You don't have to do a lot of serial look up like is that my tag is that my tag is that my if you go to a set that's only one tag to compare so these are simple right so hopefully that answers your question it's possible because i built the hardware so i can build a, a a theater with one seat per row right i mean i have full control of that and older generation of the cpu might have these type of cache because it's simple it's actually pretty simple. Um, we, we actually don't use these. It, it's just one sample of the, the cache that uh, motivate having multiple blocks per set. Oh, oh. I mean, it's possible. It's two different address, right? So this is basically, let's say this is A, right? And this is B. The top line is A's address, right? It's just basically in here for the tag is number seven, which is uh, what, one, 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 right? So that's my address. Uh, index nine was nine, one, oh, oh, one. All right. Over here, index one, oh, oh, one again. The tag is three, so it's one one and the rest are zero it's just two different addresses happen to have the same index is that that's possible right i can write a program with with that right just happen by coincidence right that a and b happen to be having the same index bits all right so it is more clear now that i put in the number in the as an address Is it more confused? I want to make sure it's not more confusing. Sorry if it is. So A and B are coming from two different cache blocks. There's only one space. There's only one space in the cache for one cache block. But the A and B are coming from two different cache blocks, and only one can be in the cache. So they kick each other out. Again, now let's think about the sample, uh, the, the question earlier where, what if you have run two program, right? What if you run two program? Now, let's look at this scenario where I have program A, 
right? That loop access to A, and then I have program B loop access to B. So if I run A alone, is that a hundred percent cache hit? I only have one access. I go to A. Is that one hundred percent cache hit? If I run just program A, never run program B. Yes. How about program B? If I run it alone, it's also one hundred percent cache hit, right? But in this case, if I run two of them together, you're not guarantee one hundred percent anymore, right? They go to the same index, so they're gonna kick each other data out, and that's why when I said we have multiple program running. They're going to compete for the space in the cache and the two programs get slower. All right. So do you see a better picture on what happens when you run multiple program at the same time in, in this scenario? But what can you do to fix this? It's like a topic of like a much, much, much. Uh, more senior class. So if you're interested in that, there's a lot of things you can do in hardware to prevent or at least mitigate this problem. Um, the next thing is the concept behind the word set associativity. This is basically n cache block per set. Because one cache block per set is not really a a high performing design, right? Maybe we, we want to make sure I have multiple cache block in the set. Because the problem with direct map cache is data access can be mapped to the same location over and over and over. So the solution is to have multiple cache block in a set. So the, the set store multiple tag. Each tag is for one of the cache block the set has. Because cache block is one single unit, a set is multiple cache blocks that uh, inside the set that has the tag and data store, right? This is called the set associative cache or n way cache. For example, a four way set associative cache means that I have four cache block per set. It's as simple as that. An eight-way cache is basically means that I have eight cache blocks per set. Any questions? Any question about this? It's actually again really simple. N-way cache means I have n cache block per set. The question you might have is like this seems like a, a, a design that makes sense, right? The thing is, if you have four-way cache versus an eight-way cache versus a 16-way cache, the more comparison you have to do, because you have to compare the tag. Is that my tag? Is that my tag? Is that my tag? Is that my tag? Imagine a movie theater that a row is four seats versus a row with 16 seats. Which one would be easier for you to search for your seat? Which one is easier? A movie theater where each row only has four seats or a movie theater where each row has 16. The fewer ones, right? Because the fewer ones you go in, okay, that's my seat. I walk two seats and like, okay, I found mine. But the one with 16 seats, you have to probably walk more steps. So again, in the cache, the same thing happened. You have to basically compare more things to find your data. So. There's a benefit in having a high associativity, which is a 16-way cache or a 32-way cache. But then you have to figure out, okay, how do you compare? How do you cut on the time to search for your data? And then you can go to the most extreme of this. Fully associative cache, basically what it means, I have one cache set. The number of ways is number of cache blocks. The block can be placed anywhere. You basically search in inside the text store for is that my data, is that my data, is that my data. 
All right. Any question about the fully associated cache? Many. So, sorry. So the same concept of caching doesn't only use in your CPU. It's used in the internet, for example, as well. Isn't this like DRAM? Uh, a little bit different because DRAM, you have an address, so you know exactly where you're going. So the, the way address works for DRAM is there's a, a set of logic to know exact role that you want. So it, it works a little bit. The, 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 the internal design of DRAM is a little bit different. The internal of DRAM is slightly different. And it, it also boils down to physics, so like how, 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 like the way you would read from DRAM is a little bit more time consuming, I guess, to put it that way, uh, because of how few electrons you, you basically store the data and the way you have to control DRAM. <clears throat> but a software, cache use this a lot what are the software cache for example we all use internet right we all use internet so one thing that you can do is to store the website that you have visited inside your computer right so there can be multiple ways that that the software can optimize by making sure the internet data is in inside your computer. So the next time you go to the website, you don't have to go through the uh, internet cable. It's actually on your computer. It's being cached. Um, you can actually use a fully associated design for this. You can use some hash based lookup as well. So if you want to make sure the search is even faster, you can hash the, the tag, for example, or the website name, for example, to figure out where to store the file, right? Uh, you can use this for data center or database as well. Uh, the way you look it up, uh, you, you, you can use a mix of different caching techniques to find your data quickly. All right. Uh, we will skip this because we will do this in there in class on Thursday because I want to tell you how, what is the policy that I can use to kick things out of the cache before we go talk about cache lookup. Uh, so Thursday, we will do an in-class exercise that come from a previous year's exam. Uh, we, will, uh, we can go through this and you basically uh, figure out, okay, is that a cache hit or is that a cache miss? And before we leave today, a few things. Uh, the first thing I want to say, right? Please keep in mind that everything, right? That you compile. This is kind of like a fallout, no, not fallout, basically, it's a like follow-up from the X86 uh, lecture. I, I forgot to tell you about this. It depends on the ISA, so depending on the compiler, and so depending on the optimization in your compiler. Uh, the thing is, you can work on an area that you optimize the compiler, or you can define your own ISA as well. For example, the RISC-5 project is kind of like a new uh, ISA that came up designed to be an open ISA. If you want to use it, it's free. And it's actually pretty darn good, actually. It's really good. It's a really well designed ISA. Um, I'll show you the LVM project a little bit. I'm sure if, you, uh, if I've shown you uh, this or not. Have I, have I shown you this thing? Okay, so the L of LVM compiler infrastructure is like a huge uh, project that uh, many people in compiler would collectively 
built and improved and also this is like a, like a, a big infrastructure and framework that began in UIUC uh, and then kind of like span into multiple research projects that you can download. That's why you say, hey, GCC is too, too mainstream. I want to do my own optimization. I want to create my own, like you came up with your own optimization not done on GCC. You can download this, implement your own optimization on top of it and package it as a new C compiler. And it works with multiple languages. For example, if you want to deal with uh, C and C++ uh, based language, you can use this uh, infrastructure called CLang. If you use Mac OS, if you use Mac OS, you might have realized that that's what, that's the thing Mac OS is using to compile C code. Uh, you can also implement your own standard library, right? Uh, and also your own API. Uh, you can work with OpenMP. OpenMP is another uh, really, really good framework for a parallel program. Uh, you can use the core uh, framework for uh, your own optimization. This is a really, really cool project for those of you who might be wondering, like, how do I, how do I build my own compiler? This is like a really, really, it's not an easy start or good start at all. You need to take a, a full-blown compiler class, but these two exist that I want to, to, to uh, tell you about. There's also this uh, RISC five. So if you want to build processor, and you don't want to pay. Uh, if you don't want to pay like Intel for the X eighty six, I actually if you don't want to pay AMD for the X eighty six ISA, uh, sixty four bits, or you don't want to like use the ARM ISA, you can use RISC five as well. And there's many many startups actually. Uh, See. Yeah, they changed the website quite a bit. There was like earlier, like a, a couple of years ago, there's also have the like a page that tell the different tools and different startups that been using RISC-5. Uh, but this is one of the up and coming ISA that you can take and it's open and free. Is open and free. This is driven by academia. Actually, this is driven by a group of researcher at the university, and they say, "Hey, because the ISA has, like, if you want to use like ARM ISA or A6 ISA, you have to pay a lot of money, right, so that you can build chip, and that that is not good for for the community who might be hey saying, hey, I want to build chips, right." RISC-5 is another really good alternative for that. That's something I want to point out. Uh, and there's actually many, many cool things out of just programming, right? Like cache friendliness that you learn in FunPAR and you learn the caching here that you see an example of code getting a lot faster just by knowing how the cache work. So I hope, I hope that after this class, you're now more aware that what you do in a program inside the for loop, for example, can have effects to performance where, for example, you don't want this to happen. This problem where I have access from two different programs kicking each other out, right? Uh, you can write a faster program if you know how caching actually works. Um, that's it for today's class, actually. I'm right on time. Uh, any other last minute question, folks? 